this lecture, we cover Thomas Hobbes, who wrote the ethical and political uh, treatise called Leviathan. Um, technically, he is an early modernist um, because of that shift away from uh, God as the center of all explanation and instead shifting over to human beings. And you see that right out of, out of the gate with Hobbes's uh, treatment of the human being. <clears throat> so one of the things interesting about Hobbes is um, he kind of starts off uh, with a biological analysis of human beings to create an ethics, uh, you know, like an ethical judgment of human beings, and then moves on to explain how that basis creates the foundation for uh, political theory. Um, it is the beginning of the modern period. People are starting to get a bigger voice in terms of being unhappy with kings and uh, landlords and aristocrats and the noble class. <clears throat> and as they begin to kind of voice their unhappiness with the feudal and monarchic um, economic and political structures and systems in place in Europe, um, some people are talking about things like, you know, um, no government at all, right, which is what we now call anarchy. And so Hobbes, who is a good loyal subject to uh, the feudal system economically and to the monarchist system politically, decides to write this book called Leviathan as a defense of why we need government. <clears throat> and so in the first bullet, Hobbes tells us that human beings are motivated by desire, that are these desires are brought on by sense stimuli, right? I mean, basically, humans are animals. Um, and we see, hear, smell, taste, and touch things. And those things make us want, right? Uh, we want someone to mate with. We want um, certain uh, smaller animals to eat. We want certain animals removed so that we can drink the water safely without having to worry about crocodiles, for example, right? So there's desires that kind of are brought on by things that we see, hear, smell, taste, and touch. <clears throat> uh, Hobbes points out that these desires pull human beings into choice and action, right? Um, you know, without desire, there is no choice. There is no action. And often, these choices and actions are set in a pursuit of resources that are required for survival. If we don't get access to the water, we die of dehydration. If we don't have a hunting ground, we die of starvation, right? Um, if we don't find a mate, then we die out as a species. And so within these realities of the natural order, the resources are of limited availability. And this puts human beings into a relationship of competition with each other for survival of the fittest. Right? This is way before Darwin. All right, Darwin's about 200 years later. Um, and Hobbes points out that in a state of nature, with no social or political order, human beings are endowed with absolute freedom, uh, owing allegiance to no one but themselves. We are absolutely free. We can do whatever we want. We can fight to the death for resources, or we can run away, or we can give up, or we can allow ourselves to die, or we can cheat, we can lie, we can steal, right? Um, <clears throat> this freedom that uh, we have without government is kind of fused with that competition 
for survival. And the result is that a state of nature is a place with no law, no rule, right? Um, there's The only law is the law of nature itself. And the law of nature itself is primarily that anything is permitted for the sake of per preservation of the self, right? In order to survive, you're allowed to do anything. That is the law of nature. <clears throat> Um, and so in the next bullet, Hobbes points out that, you know, a state of nature is what he calls a state of anarchy. No political system is in place. And in this, bellum omnium contra omnes, right? A war of all men against all for the survival of the fittest is always in place. Like there's no time out for it, right? And here, fittest doesn't mean the strongest always it means the one able to get the upper hand the one able to get the advantage that's the fittest <clears throat> either through strength strategy cunning viciousness alliances or whatever right whatever you can find to survive with but basically anarchy is a state of nature where it is dominated by a war of everyone against everyone because everybody needs the same stuff to survive. In the next bullet, he points out that this competition for survival is never ending. There's no way to rest. Right? Human life, he says, becomes nasty, brutish, and short. Right? There can be no stability. Um, there's no way to like take a break. As soon as you close your eyes, someone kills you for your cave, right? Uh, there's no way to create education or progress because as soon as you teach other people your skills, they kill you so they don't have to share it with you because they don't need you anymore, right? So there's no way to like pass on from one generation to the next because there's nothing. there's no cooperation. Therefore, Human beings decide to end the state of nature. They come together to create a social contract that will bind everyone together in a commonwealth. Notice, commonwealth is a British word for nation or state. And it's a good word for it because it brings out exactly why we come together. We come together for the wealth in common, for the benefit of all. And so Hobbes, his point is that it's out of like a, a fear of anarchy, a fear of state of nature, a fear of nasty, brutish, short lives that we come together to create a social contract, which is an agreement that we all follow so that we all have things taken care of, right? So that we don't live in a state of nature, right? And so the commonwealth, he says in the next bullet, can only be established by trading in absolute freedom in exchange for giving a sovereign absolute power, right? So we no longer have absolute freedom. We give the king or the queen or the emperor or the pharaoh or the czar, right? We give them absolute power. Um, the promise is that we give them absolute power so they can do the job in exchange for protecting life, liberty, and property, right? So we trade in absolute freedom for limits called laws, right? We give absolute power to the sovereign, and in exchange, the sovereign gives us life, liberty, and property, right? That's what they promise to protect in each of us. Protect us from murder, protect us from theft, protect us from kidnapping and enslavement, right? In the next bullet, the sovereign begins to establish laws and chooses enforcers to go around giving up punishment in order to create social order, right? And so notice that, um, so, you know, the social order is created through fear of violence, and this is what preserves people. I can go to sleep without being afraid of getting murdered 
because people won't murder me since they're afraid of being executed. I can go to work without being afraid of coming home to find someone else in my home because people don't want to steal property because they're afraid that their property is going to be taken if they get caught, right? So this is kind of like threat from the sovereign and the enforcers, and that threat is called law, right? That's what we call the law. So now we have these limited freedoms. I'm not free to kill whoever I want. I'm not free to steal whatever I want. I'm no longer following the laws of nature. Now I'm following the laws of the sovereign, which is usually the laws of a man. Notice that the sovereign or the king gives out punishment through the enforcers that match the exact things that were promised to us in the first place, right? Notice that if you break the law, right, the, the, the law promises to protect your property, but if you break the law, they take your property. The law promises to protect your liberty, your freedom, but if you break the law, the, the state threatens your freedom by threatening you with prison. The state promises to protect our lives. However, if you take other people's lives, then your life is taken from you, right? So the same things that are promised are the same things that are threatened within, you know, a, a, a social contract. Um, by coming together <clears throat> as one people underneath one king, right, people become an immense social body where the sovereign rules as the head, his enforcers become the hands, right? Meeting out justice and maintaining order and the subjects become all the other limbs and organs that keep the social body alive. So notice like in the picture here, right? You have the king at the top, right? As the head and then you've got the sword in the hands, right? That's the sword of punishment through soldiers, through law enforcement, through knights. Uh, and then if you look at the chest, the chest is made out of like individual people, right? Carpenters, farmers, <clears throat> um, blacksmiths. And together, they create the body of the kingdom, right? Um, the, they represent the limbs and the organs that kind of keep the social body alive. Um, notice there's two possibilities once a commonwealth is created. <clears throat> In the first one, the sovereign, the enforcers, and the subjects, the people, the citizens, they remain steadfast in the terms of the social contract. They keep faith with the social contract. Right? They, they agree to it. They're going to stick to it. And if this is the case, if everybody sticks to it, the commonwealth remains what Hobbes calls a kingdom of light, where the well-being of all is maintained, right? The people become a family. They take care of each other. That's a kingdom of light. However, the last bullet points out, if any or all of the members, the sovereign, the enforcers, and the subject, do not remain faithful in the terms of the social contract. The commonwealth becomes uh, either, it becomes a king of, kingdom of darkness, right? It either becomes a dystopian tyranny, right? Because the king becomes a tyrant and creates a dystopian world for everybody. Or it reverts back to a state of nature, right? Because it comes back to an apocalyptic anarchy created either by civil war or social chaos uh, as the government is removed, right? Or through revolution and so on. So, you know, you're either in a dystopian kingdom of darkness where the government's in control of you, or you're in an apocalyptic, anarchic kingdom of darkness where everybody's killing everybody all over again, or you're in a kingdom of light where people are all kind of sticking to what they agreed to, right? And those are the options for people, right? For, for him, those, there's no other option when it comes to how kingdoms are set up. 
Um, the reason it's called the Leviathan, right? The Leviathan was a huge creature sleeping at the bottom of the sea, waiting for the call from God to destroy the cities of men. You can see that the Leviathan he is here in the picture, right? The Leviathan is not a sea serpent. The Leviathan is the social body of the commonwealth. We are the Leviathan because we can accomplish anything when we work behind our king, at least according to Hobbes. Um, <clears throat> notice that other one other thing before I let you go, um, that Hobbes' uh, perspective of human beings is pessimistic at best, mm -hmm. right? We are desiring selfish animals willing to kill even our own parents for survival, right? Um, there is no ultimate good for Hobbes. Um, you know, there's no such thing as happiness, like for the Greeks, eudaimonia. Or, you know, he does believe in God, but he does not propose that God is like the ultimate good, like it is for the medieval theologians, right? Um, for Hobbes, he tells us very early on that uh, humans have to desire and keep desiring in order to stay alive, right? We are like sharks that have to keep moving forward, um, consuming anything in our way, and that is our very nature and purpose as living things. Um, and so he definitely has a dark view of human beings, uh, considering that he's giving us an ethical theory his ethical theory is basically that we should do what's good for all of us out of fear of, you know, the kingdoms of darkness, right? Out of fear of the state of nature or fear of tyranny, right? This concludes Thomas Hobbes. There's definitely a lot more to cover with him, but this is just kind of a brief intro to kind of get you started to help you make sense of what you read. Um, Good luck with Thomas Hobbes, and I'll see you for the next lecture.